North Korea is pretty much the most isolated country on the entire planet. And it's really hard to get any concrete information out of that country. But also, often when you do get information out of that country, it is pretty much skewered by the Western press for sensationalist headlines. Now, when I was making my video about right-wing podcast grifters, which have inspired two videos this week, I came across someone called Yonmi Park. Now, I hadn't actually heard of this person before, but they are a North Korean refugee. And why they caught my eye is because they have pretty much been exclusively appearing on right-wing news channels and right-wing podcasts to talk about North Korea. So I thought it was someone who'd be interesting to look into. Surprise, surprise, I found that this person is quite notorious for embellishing their stories about North Korea and flat out contradicting themselves multiple times because they actually did a lot of press about it in South Korea when they were 21. I think they're now 27 and now they're doing this like podcast circuit where their story is in essence completely changing. And even at the time when she first came out of North Korea, a lot of other North Korean refugees actually disputed her accounts of what was happening. So today what I wanted to do is take a look at Yonmi Park, then talk about North Korean refugees and why a lot of their stories don't really hold up to scrutiny sometimes. And then I'll probably just end it with my general opinion on North Korea because it's an issue, I guess, that most leftists talk about. Someone said in my last video that I'm always pretty good with the anti-imperialism stuff. So I'm probably going to be looking at North Korea through like this anti-imperialist angle and then talking about the regime in general. So not a big fan of the Kims or anything, but I feel like this issue does deserve nuance. I'm gonna play my social media and Patreon for about one minute. Skip if you're not interested. Before we get any further, a lot of my work on this channel is demonetized because when you're covering more serious, sometimes edgier topics, YouTube doesn't like this. So if you've ever enjoyed my work, please consider becoming a patron. And you don't have to pledge a crazy amount. I want to build up my Patreon based on as many people as possible pledging little amounts, like a dollar or two. So if, you know, you feel like I have ever brought anything that's worthwhile into your life and my content, please really consider becoming a patron to help me continue to do this, regardless of if YouTube monetize or not most of my videos in a given month. Also, if you want to join our communities, come check out our Discord and my subreddit. Those links in the description. And if you want to follow me personally, please check out the Cavernacle at Twitter, at Instagram, and also my personal Reddit where you can keep up to date with all my content and what I'm doing. Every 5k, we get a new chocolate orange. Help me build this pyramid as high as we can before the end of 2021. I live stream two times a week, although I've been pretty bad at this lately, but all of that stuff is archived on the Cavernacle Extra, and that is my second channel, link in the description. So talking about Yomi Park, what I wanna do first is talk about her recent appearances on media, and then show you a little bit of what she's been saying, and then I wanna kind of go back and look into if this person is a reliable voice on North Korea, but she has a quite sizable YouTube channel now, over 600,000 subscribers. Now her videos primarily center around uh, Kim Jong-un and just talking about various things going on in this country. Now I'm already pretty skeptical looking at this as a starting point because how many times have we heard bizarre rumors about Kim Jong-un, like he's passed away or his sister is the new ruler of North Korea and then it turns out not to be true because a lot of the information you get out of this country is either totally unreliable or seemingly made up by the intelligence services in Japan, South Korea and the US. Now, if we go onto their Twitter, you can get a window into how they have shifted their experience in North Korea to a more, I guess, libertarian right-wing grift. So, Yomi Park has 95,000 followers, North Korean human rights activist, author of In Order to Live, a North Korean girl's journey to freedom, and TED speaker, BBC 100 Women. So, she talks a lot about her channel getting demonetized, but if you can see by the title, it's not big tech censorship, it's just like YouTube rules. Very annoying for someone like me who talks about political issues to get monetized. So I simplify a tiny bit there. But if you look at that title, then it's not very surprising. So she's plugging her Patreon. She's talking more about like Big Brother, YouTube, demonetizing her stuff, 
while she talks about Joe Biden betraying people in Afghanistan. Of course, like a lot of people who escape regimes that, you know, say they are socialist communists, she is very anti-communist. So she says it's time to unite and fight against Marxism in this country, talking about the US, if we don't want to end up like the people of North Korea. She also quotes Martin Luther King to talk about Afghanistan. These, these right-wing types always love to quote Martin Luther King. They should probably spend some more time on Fortnite, I guess. So life's most persistent, urgent question is, what are you doing for others? Let's do everything we can to speak for the people of Afghanistan. So now something that's very weird, but very on brand, Jordan Peterson has been a massive promoter of Yomi Park, promoting her book here, you can see on Twitter, promoting her tweets all the time. Yomi Park also says, no society is free from corruption. The difference is that the Amer is that America Corruption is viewed as an exception, not the rule. A patriot's history of the US. Very ironic considering America is pretty much the most brazenly corrupt Western democracy. Of course, they are posing in front of a turning point little hologram. And then also says, if living in freedom is not a paradise, then what is? When North Koreans cross frozen river and Gobi Desert to be free, we say that we are crossing the border into paradise. I never even knew what cherries were when I was living in the so-called socialist paradise North career and then simping for america more she says how can anyone not be grateful for this amazing country and western civilization that gave rise to so much innovation and prosperity and then she's talking about north korea to abc and she says the first thing my mother told me was don't even whisper because the birds and mice can hear me the most dangerous weapon was my tongue if i said the wrong thing they would not just kill me but three generations of my family would lose their lives so we're gonna get back to all this later but she wasn't from a poor family in north korea quite the opposite in fact and everything about like free speech and what she had to eat is all pretty distorted. Not saying they're complete lies, but there are different stages of her life in North Korea which have very, very different circumstances. So she is also appealing to right-wingers when talking about things like trans issues and the war of wokeism, she calls it, and right-wingers call it. That's why Jordan Peterson likes her, and that's why Glenn Beck likes her. So let's play you some clips of her talking to these people. I probably will just show the audio in a picture. I wanna be really careful not to get like copyright strike for stuff on this specific video. At Colombia, it was almost like North Korea in some sense. I mean, even North Korea wasn't that crazy compared to America's wokeism. It's a- uh, it, Wait, 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 hold it, just a second. <laughs> Even North Korea was not as crazy as American wokeism? Is that what you just said? Yeah. Because, I mean, the punishment, of course, in North Korea is going to be three generations execution. But the thing is, the, I mean, in Colombia, they teach you sensitivity training, right? It's mandatory. How can you be, how you should be so sensitive to every oppression, every injustice that you see. And then, of course, in North Korea, we don't have 90 different pronouns, right? Like, instead of, like, in, in front, before the, every lecture, especially thinking about this big lecture, like, over 100 students at there, and you survey class, everybody say before their name major, they go talk about their pronouns. And then some of them are gender fluid, so they might feel like a boy in the morning and go, like, afternoon. How are they supposed to know that? So instead of me trying to understand who they are as a person, as a character, and their contents, I am obsessed with memorizing their pronouns so I don't look like a bigot. I mean, what a waste of time. So she's saying America is worse because there are gender-fluid people, non-binary people, and transgender people, so that's worse than North Korea. Seriously, if we're meant to believe that North Korea is basically this horrible hellhole backwater with like, you know, draconian laws, punishments that are so brutal for minor crimes. I mean, you go on right wing channels and say, actually America is worse because of gender pronouns. Again, it does kind of defeat the whole argument you're trying to make that North Korea is a horrible totalitarian dictatorship and this is because of Marxism. So she also said a very similar thing to the Telegraph. Worse than North Korea. At least in North Korea, we know what women is, what men is. And of course, Jordan Peterson loves her. And she was talking about having to eat like grasshoppers and tree bark and flowers to survive in North Korea. So tell me a bit about what it was like when you were a kid in the 90s in Korea with regards to eating. North Koreans are on average three to four inch shorter than South Koreans because of the malnutrition. I'm like five two, but most of North Korean men are shorter than me. So if we are 
above 410 feet high, you must go to military. So tons of North Korean adult men are around 410, like even below that right now. So this severe malnutrition affects even our brain development. North Korea's average life expectancy is like, if somebody lives up to 60, we think they lived a really long life. Being in North Korea, of course, like only way for me to get my proteins were eating you know, grasshoppers, dragonflies, a lot of insects, tree barks, plants, flowers. And that's how we survive. And most of people die in the spring because that's when there is no like really insects and plants are. And majority of people die in that time. Now, as we're going to get to, Yomi Park is embellishing a lot of this stuff. And it's clear she has sold out for this right-wing grift as well. And that has been going on for years. Now it's clear Yomi Park has fully embraced this right-wing grift. And it is also clear from work done previous that she is either embellishing or making up a lot of details about her life in North Korea. So The Diplomat did a really, really extensive article by Mary Ann Jolly, who basically researched this person in depth to show where they are probably not being honest or maybe because they were a child, they don't remember growing up in North Korea in the way they actually grew up. So this was back in 2014 and Mary writes, I met Yomi Park a few months ago when I spent two weeks filming a story about her and her family for Australia's SPS Dateline. We called the story Celebrity Defector. Back in South Korea where she lives now, Park is one of the stars of a television program featuring a cast of North Korean women. It's called Now On My Way To Meet You and it daringly satirizes the Kim Dynasty. The women tell personal anecdotes about their lives in North Korea and their journey to the South. A number of the women were introduced to us as have been homeless and starving the reason they fled. Buried in the show's archives are some snapshots of Park's childhood in North Korea that explain why she's known on the show as the Paris Hilton of North Korea. They're in sharp contrast to the story she's now telling her international audience. In one episode in early 2013, she appears with her mother. Family photographs are flashed on the screen and Park jokes, that's my mum there. She's beautiful, right? To be honest, I'm not the Paris Hilton. My mum is the real Paris Hilton. Park then goes on to point out the top and checkered pants her mother is wearing were all imported from Japan and adds, my mum even carried around a Chanel bag in North Korea, to which the host responds incredulously, there are Chanel bags in North Korea? Park tells him there are, and he then asks another woman if she'd classify Park's family as rich, and the woman answers, yes, that's right. So it's already clear that Park comes off from a well-off family in North Korea, and she wasn't eating grasshoppers every day to survive and tree bark and flowers if her mum had imported stuff from Japan. So it goes on, Park told us in her interview, her father was a member of the workers party, as were all men in her family, and she was expected to study medicine at university and marry a man of the same ilk or higher. She described her father as a very free man who was critical of the regime. She said when reports of Kim Jong-il's daily activities would come on the television and the announcer would say, because of his mercy, we are having a good life. Her father would sometimes say, oh, shut up, then turn off the TV. Park says her mother would chastise him for saying such things in front of her and her sister, so she learned early on it was dangerous to criticise the regime and to speak about her father's disloyalty to others. I mean, Park touched on that with her mother saying that she should shut up, and that kind of plays into it, but also kind of shows that her father wasn't, like, living in fear every day, and he did have his own opinions. Park's mother told us of a day when her husband pointed at the portraits of Kim Il-sung and Kim Jong-il hanging on their walls and saying... Our struggles are caused by these men. She was terrified he would say something outside the house, but told us she knew of a few people who shared her husband's views. Other North Korean defectors from Haisan, the northern city that borders China, where Park and her family hail from, have also told me that after the Great Famine in the mid-90s, there was growing dissent within immediate families. Park was nine in 2002, and she says she saw her best friend's mother executed at a stadium in Haisan, but according to several North Korean defectors from Haisan, who didn't want to be identified, Public executions only ever took place on the outskirts of the city, most at the airport. The last they recall was a mass execution of 10 or 11 people in 1999, and there were none after 2000. Park's account of the mother's crimes changes constantly, depending, it seems, on her audience. In Europe recently, she claimed women were executed for watching James Bond, sometimes less specifically a Hollywood movie. But in Hong Kong a few months ago, she told an audience the women had been caught watching South Korean DVDs. 
Irish independent journalist Nicola Anderson in a recent online video interview with Park seemed confused and asked her, it was a movie from South Korea, wasn't it? And her response was, no Hollywood movie, James Bond. So this is just someone who seems quite untrustworthy to say the least. One of the world's leading authorities in North Korea is Andre Lankov, a professor at Cookman University in Seoul. Born in the USSR, he was an exchange student in North Korea during the 1980s and has interviewed hundreds of defectors. He says, I'm very skeptical whether watching a Western movie would lead to an execution. An arrest for such an action is possible indeed, but still not likely. He says the sorts of crimes that result in these public executions are murder, large-scale theft, especially government property, sometimes involvement with large-scale smuggling operations. A 59-year-old woman from Haisan who escaped in 2009 laughed when asked if anyone was ever executed watching an American movie. How can you be executed for watching an American film? It sounds ridiculous even to say it. That never happened before. I go to church with around 350 defectors and you ask any of them and they will say exactly the same thing, she told us over the phone from South Korea. Other defectors confirmed this. In 2003, when she was 10, Park tells of how her world came crashing down when her father was arrested for illegal trading. His conviction meant other family members were also criminals and their position in society plummeted. Then our destiny was clear, Park said. I was going to be a farmer. There was no way I can get into university. When she spoke to us, Park told of how her and her sister at just 9-11 were left to fend for themselves after their parents were jailed. We couldn't go to school, we just go down to the riverside, we have a shower, wash our clothes, and then we go to the mountain to get the grass to eat, and that's the sort of stuff she was saying to Jordan Peterson. But in a BBC radio interview, Park claimed her sister went to live at her uncle's house, and she went to live at her aunt's house in the countryside for three years. She told of how while she was there, she ate wild food like grass or dragonflies, just anything I could eat at the time. But just two days later, she told the Irish Independent that she and her sister survived by finding food to eat and had learned how to cook for themselves. When asked by the reporter whether any adults that knew you were alone, Park answered, no, people were dying there. They don't care. I saw lots of dead bodies in the street and nobody can take care of anybody. But go back through the archives of the South Korean television news show, Now On My Way To Meet You, in which Park stars, and in the same episode referred to previously, the host of the show says to Park's mother, when we talk about stories of people eating grass or struggling to eat, Yiju, Park's pseudonym, says, oh, that never happened. Why is that? Did Yiju never go through these experiences? Park's mother replies, we were not to that extent. We were just never in a position where we were starving. The next part of the exchange is equally enlightening. Park's mama goes on to say, so when Yiju started working for this program, I think she became more aware of the situation in North Korea. The host responds, it sounds like Yiju learnt heaps on this program. And Park's mother says, she calls me before and after a show recording asking me, am I really North Korean? She says she has no idea what the other girls on the show are talking about. She says she thinks everyone is lying on the show. So clear inconsistencies to what happened. Some stuff that seems like complete fabrication or at least misremembering things like the executions at the stadium. And her own mother saying that she's learned a lot about the North Korean situation when she left North Korea and they never were really starving. Again, this is her own mother saying this stuff. So it's very clear Yomi Park is not a reliable source on what it was like to grow up in North Korea. Like, I'm not doubting she grew up in North Korea. I'm not doubting there are certain things that she remembers, like we say about her father criticizing the Kims and the mother saying that you shouldn't do that in front of the children. She says, you know, about that now. But when she's talking about eating the grasshoppers and everything, she gives three different accounts of the situation at the time when her father was arrested. And then her own mother says, we were never starving. So again, all of this put together, it makes her a very unreliable narrator. And the bit about her learning what North Korea was like when she was in South Korea and also not having a relatable experience with the other North Korean refugees and asking if she actually is North Korean, I think says a lot. Now, I want to go on to the Guardian article. Because it's like, why do so many North Korean testimonies fall apart? So Park is one who has given so many different accounts of living in North Korea that seemingly contradict each other but there are multiple people who have done this so the article was done by Ji Yong Song for the NK News part of the North Korea network and it says in a report released last year the UN accused a North Korean leader Kim Jong-un of crimes against humanity and called for the case to be referred to the International Criminal Court UN investigators had been denied access to the country so the organization had instead carried out 240 interviews of North Korean refugees living in South Korea, Japan, the UK and the US, including Shin Dong-hyuk, 
whose story was told in the best-selling Escape from Camp 14. This guy was quite famous. I don't know if you guys remember. In January, the North Korean government released a video claiming to show Shin's father denouncing his son's stories as fake. Now that sounds like, you know, something that you could easily coerce, but when questioned, Shin confessed that parts of his account were also inaccurate including sections on his time in Camp 14, the infamous labor camp for political prisoners. Shin is not alone. Another North Korean, Lee Son Uk, offered testimony to the US House of Representatives in 2004, describing the killing of Christians in North Korea. But Lee's testimony was challenged by Chang in -suk, the head of the North Korean Defectors Association in Seoul, who claimed to know firsthand that Lee had never been a political prisoner. Many former North Korean citizens on the website NKNet agreed Lee's accounts were unlikely to be true. So the person who wrote this article says that I have been interviewing North Koreans as um, a North Korean watcher and human rights researcher since 1999. What I found suggests there are serious ethical dilemmas in the way which we gather information. And then it goes on to say, what is behind the inconsistencies? Cash payments in return for interviews with North Korean refugees have been standard practice in the field for years. This practice also drives demand for saleable stories. The more exclusive, shocking or emotional, the higher the fee. North Korean refugees have become well aware of what the interviewer wants to hear. Whether speaking to the UN, US Congress or Western media, the questions are the same every time. Did you leave North Korea and how terrible is it? With the number of defectors reaching 20,000 in 2010, first person testimonies have become the norm and have increasingly come to involve younger victims with more tragic, dramatic, visual and emotional accounts. Although there are ways to confirm information through cross-examination and by consulting multiple sources, these methods are highly time consuming while a significant amount of the information disclosed by a single source is simply unverifiable given the fiercely secretive nature of North Korea. But many refugees say they feel pressure pressured for the factor stories. Ahn Myung Chol, a former prison guard at Camp 22, said people liked shocking stories and these so-called defector activists were merely responding to desire. Chong Kwang Il, a former prisoner at Camp 15, said the fame brought by media exposure trapped them, forcing them to reproduce a certain narrative. Choi Sung Chol from the Korean Nationality Residents Association said the link between small and large inconsistencies was often hard to draw. Most North Koreans do not worry about the small factual mistakes as long as the big picture that North Korea violates human rights is right. Choi added, we North Koreans know what is true and what is fake, but at the same time, we do not want to ruin the bigger political moves like the UN Committee of Investigation or the US Human Rights Act. That was a very interesting article and it shows that there are loads of defectors. Despite, you know, this sort of narrative we're sold that there's barely anyone who leaves North Korea, if you live in South Korea, it said by that time there have been thousands of defectors all having their own stories of what happened. And there is financial incentive, of course, but also this broader narrative because you want to play into what the UN think or what the US think or what Western media wants to hear. Shocking stories about a very secretive place. The more brutal, the better. And in the case of Yomi Park, it's pretty clear this seems to have influenced her as well. And that's why she's going on right-wing media outlets saying, you know, the West is worse than North Korea in some regards because of wokeism. Or I'm going to give loads of different accounts through all the years I've come out of North Korea. And then I'm going to give you another account, Jordan Peterson, Joe Rogan, Lex Fridman, all these different people. And what is actually totally embarrassing is that a lot of these people just don't read about this stuff. Type in Yomi Park onto Google and just type in lies or something, you get these articles questioning her accounts, right? Someone like Jordan Peterson, he doesn't care. Why doesn't he care? Because he's this rabid anti-communist. So anyone who furthers his narrative about socialism leading to totalitarianism is great for him. Why is he going to challenge that? And of course, like this says, because North Korea is so secretive, it's often hard to verify these personal accounts. But then it's good for us in my research that Yomi Park actually starred on a TV show of her mother where they literally have contradicted everything they've ever told people like Jordan Peterson. But these people are useful to Americans who want to continue to isolate North Korea. Now, I want to give my broader take on North Korea. This is my North Korean video after all. So my take on North Korea is, of course, it's very hard to understand what is going on there. And it's clear, like, if you read defectors and refugees who seem more honest than Yomi Park, it is a pretty brutal place to live if you speak out of turn, for example, or if you're caught doing crimes. It is not like how we're told 
but it is, you know, not a great place to live. So I totally sympathize with the people suffering there. I'm not a fan of North Korea at all. Some leftists seem to like link in North Korea with like something like Cuba or Vietnam, and I kind of reject those comparisons a lot. I don't feel like they're the same, but where things like Cuba and maybe Iran are the same as North Korea is that there is an interest for the US to isolate this group, right? North Korea has suffered sanctions throughout basically its entire existence. And in my mind, sanctions never work. Look at Iraq, look at Venezuela, look at Cuba, look at Iran. All it does is create suffering for the poorest people there. There are a few examples of where sanctions have actually worked. South Africa is probably one, but that was also like a wider BDS style movement to boycott South Africa. It wasn't just sanctions against it. But in Iraq, it was a disaster. It's a disaster for places like Cuba and in North Korea as well. What it does is it isolates them further, which is the goal. But when you actually have a quite powerful country in terms of this military dictatorship in North Korea, which do have very big arsenals of nuclear weapons, conventional missiles, even some reports of a lot of, you know, really high tech bioweapons as well. And actually a very big standing military, which is of course, backed by China as well. This is a country that is not going anywhere and all that happens with sanctions is you're gonna create worse conditions for the poorest people there. So by and large, I'm against sanctioning these countries and isolating them further. I think the only way these countries are gonna change is if you accept them into the global community. Now, one other thing I want to address broadly, I think a lot of Western leftists don't seem to understand that no matter how bad these regimes are, the reason they can often maintain control is propaganda, but propaganda that is also fitting in with people's personal experiences. So when we talk about the Korean War, we often think about the Korean War in terms of what Korea became and what North Korea became specifically. We don't think about what North Korea was. So my grandma is 91, born in 1930. If she was from North Korea, she would have experienced the brutal Japanese occupation. She would have experienced the end of the Second World War. She would have experienced the brutal Korean War where 25% of North Korean civilians were killed by mass bombing campaigns by the UN, led by the US. And she would have remembered all that stuff, right? And think about that context as well with the US rebuilding Japan, helping to make it one of the most powerful countries in the world and also not holding them accountable for any of this stuff. It's still a massive sticking point between South Korea and Japan, let alone North Korea and Japan. So if you grow up in this context and you have this lived in experience, why would you want this government to necessarily change anyway? I'm not saying that there isn't dissatisfaction. So this propaganda is more effective because it takes the truth of these people's lived in experience, which they would obviously pass on to their children and grandchildren. You would hear about that stuff. And then just like with, you know, Iran or Cuba or countries that use anti-US sentiment, they actually have real world examples that their own citizens lived in to help make this propaganda more effective. So isolating it even further, putting more sanctions on it, backing Japan, backing South Korea, of course, with its massive military aid to South Korea and helping it, really just plays into this narrative that the North Korean government are probably using all the time. So in my mind, sanctions on North Korea are ridiculous and sanctions by the US are always used selectively. So Russia, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, North Korea get the sanctions. Saudi Arabia, no sanctions. Brutal dictatorships backed by the US constantly throughout history, no sanctions. And they always talk about human rights. US does not care about human rights. It's all about geopolitics. And people like Yomi Park and other refugees who are often pressured to sell this narrative are obviously just damaging people who live in North Korea because you're playing into the hands of the neoconservatives or even the neoliberals in the US intelligence services or military circles that North Korea and the dictatorship needs to be toppled like violently. That's what George Bush wanted to do to save these people. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that video. It's something I wanted to do for a while. And thankfully this Yomi part became so prominent in my search for these podcasts. Just found a good person to bounce off. If you want to follow me on social media at the Cavernacle on Twitter and Instagram, if you want to join our communities, Discord and my subreddit in the description. And if you want to support my work on Patreon, check that out as well. And if you made it this far, thank you all for watching.